These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos .htm. Or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you. First of all, there are some tricks and techniques for multi-step synthesis that most students don't know or don't use. And that's one reason why they have trouble with those. Okay. But that is not the main reason why people have trouble with those problems. The main reason people have trouble with multi-step syntheses is that they haven't learned the reactions. Um, it's a very simple problem. Those are the advanced problems in the course. Um, and the only way to be able to get those right is to have mastery of the basic reactions. Um, and what usually happens is that people don't really have mastery of the basic reactions, so obviously you can't expect to be able to come up with the right reactions in the right order if you don't have that mastery. Well, one thing, so one of the main things you need to be worrying about now, I guess your exam is on Monday? Yeah. So the one, one of the main things you have to be doing now is making a list of all the reactions that you're expected to know. All the reactions. All the reactions. At this point, you're, uh, the instructor expects that you have mastery of all the reactions that have come up in the course, and that's what you need to be able to get these multi-step synthesis problems uh, right. So I was saying that uh, the most important thing is not special techniques for multi-step synthesis, but just knowing the basic reactions. But of course, that's true for all the questions you're going to see. The, the first step to being able to do any of the questions on the exam yeah. is having as much mastery as possible of the basic reactions. That means what are their starting materials, what are their products, and what are their mechanisms. And that's a lot of work right there. So one thing you want to be doing with your study time now is making a big list of all the major reactions in the course. And he kind of did that in the review, right? He went, he paired You mean like all the additions of alkene to alkenes and alkenes? Everything, that's right. But it's good to have them in groups. So yeah, absolutely, you should have one page that has all the major alkenes. That's right. It sounds like your instructor might have already done that in class. He kind of, sort, sort of, he, sort of, he more pairs more to do it in. Okay. Just for alkenes, though. Yeah. Right. Well, you kind of have to do that for all the major reactions that you've seen. So you should have a piece of paper that has all the major reactions, one by one, with their mechanisms. And then, to, if you really want to improve on that, then you take another piece of paper where you just put down the starting materials. And then an hour later, you have to come through and make test yourself and see that you can write down the right mechanisms and products for all of those. Um, and you do that over and over and over until it's easy. Um, and that's the most useful thing you can do to prepare yourself for any of the types of questions on the test. Make sure you have mastery of the reactions. You need to have one piece of paper that has the correct starting materials, products, and mechanisms. And then you need to make another piece of paper that leaves something out. Um, and then you need to be able to go back and fill those in over and over until it's easy. The analogy I like is that knowing the reactions is like knowing how the pieces move in chess. Obviously, you can't play chess unless you have mastery of how the pieces move. So suppose someone was playing chess and they looked at the bishop, and they thought for 15 seconds, and then they remembered how the bishop moved. Well, they couldn't pat themselves on the back and say, gee, it only took me 15 seconds to remember how the bishop moves. If it takes you 15 seconds to remember how each piece moves, you're dead. You need to be able to just know automatically how the pieces move. Well, that's what your instructor hopes you've accomplished with the reactions at this point in the course, that you know automatically how the reactions work. Well, in the time that you have left, you want to get as close to that as you can. Obviously, not everyone does what the instructor thinks that they've done. Two days. Okay. Not everyone's going to achieve that mastery, but that's one of the main things to work on. Yeah. Um, getting as much of that mastery as you can. Um, and if you don't have that, you can't be that surprised if a lot of the problems, especially the multi-step synthesis, are um, difficult for you. Those are really, n trying to do those without knowing the reactions is like trying to play chess when it takes you 15 seconds to remember how each piece moves. All right, so one of the best things we can do today is try to find some reactions that you might not know and put those on the blackboard so you can put them on your piece of paper and drill on those on the next, uh, on the next few days. And the tricks. And the tricks too, that's right. <laughs> but like I said, um, the like tricks won't work it. unless you know how the pieces yeah. move. Um, okay. Yeah, so we wanted to go through um, those uh, key reactions as we, uh, as we go through. Because, not, um, well, I don't know how your instructor works, but probably you won't see these specific problems on the exam. Right? You'll see similar problems, and the only way to be able to deal with them is to know the reactions we're talking about. Right? Thank you. That's uh, question 947. Right. Um, the that's the first multi step synthesis. This one here. Well, we're not going to get through all of them. Oh, so okay. Now, the first thing you should do here is look at the, uh, the reagents A through L. And ask yourself, 
do I know what reaction each of these is going to go through? Those are the pieces that you need to be comfortable with. Because again, you won't see question 947 on the test. You'll see these reagents on the test. And what you need to ask yourself is, do I know how these reagents work? So what you want to ask is, what is the other functional group that I would add to each of these reagents, and then what product would I get? Uh, and then if you know that, then we, uh, then we have a chance of trying to figure out how to do the transformation in 947. So let's take a few seconds to try to attack this. And obviously, um, you want to use any of the tricks and techniques that we've already talked about in, in the tutoring to, to, to try to, to get, come to grips with this. to uh, criticize you for not thinking about that. So <laughs> excellent that you're thinking about that. Remember, what you need to ask yourself is, what functional group does each of these reagents react on? Because they're not just going to react on anything. They only react in certain cases. So the thought process you just went through is you said, gee, I can't use K until I have an alkene. So that's the exact thought oh, process okay. that you have to be going so through there. How do we create an alkene? We that's the next thought process that you have to do. Yeah. That's excellent. Very good. Now we're on a roll. Terrific. Okay. That's right. So so elimination reaction would take a strong, well, yeah, bulky, bulky strong base. base. Great. Okay. Very good. So like this one, A. Oh, because it's a negative, uh, negative oxygen. And it's a tertiary. Oh, that's right, because we, yeah. we need several. How about AK? That's <laughs> <laughs> my vote. OK. AK. What do you think? Yeah, I'm not getting the A step yet, but because um, you say that's the one that cleaves it? I mean, that's the one that makes it into an alkene. Mm -hmm. Anytime you want to make a double bond, you usually want to use a bulky base. So that you get an elimination reaction. Instead of an SN2. You okay. Put an SN2, right? Okay. Or a substitution, actually, a substitution reaction. Okay. So the only bulky base there looks like that one, I think. Yeah. Okay. Because oh, most of these are all reacting only on alkene. Anyway, like a good percentage of them. Alkenes, you mean? Sorry, alkenes. Okay. Do we win? All right. Well, <laughs> you partially win, and we're not ready to declare victory yet. But a lot of the thought processes you went through there are good. So let's see. Let's use the techniques we're supposed to use. One technique that maybe is not too crucial here, but we should get in the habit of using is numbering. Uh, remember that numbering should be our default. The only time we don't number is when the problem is boringly easy. Well, I, don't, I would put that, this problem in that category. So let's put in some numbers. Now, these are not IUPAC numbers. They're just reference numbers. So we can put any numbers that we want while putting the same numbers as, uh, well, I just make up some numbers. So let's call it one at the top. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, the purpose of the numbers is to identify carbons in one picture that are the same as the carbon in another picture. Well, let's give a number to this carbon. Uh, I guess I could call it anything uh, at this point. So I'll call it number one. And then what would I call this carbon? Wait, the same as that side, though? Don't we usually name them? Well, the point is, these carbons are coming from here. Oh, right. They are the same carbons. We name the ones in the reaction a different number. If I was adding a new reagent, I wouldn't want to call those one, two, three, and four. Maybe that'll be clearer as we go along. But the point is, these carbons are coming from here, so they should be given the same numbers. If we introduce new carbons, they'll need new numbers like 7, 8, and 9. Well, if this is number 1, maybe I'll call this 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. 
Of course, there's many legal ways you could number this. Uh, these are not IUPAC numbers, they're just reference numbers. I don't think numbering is actually very crucial in this problem, but we want to get into the habit of doing it. Now, remember that your first, uh, so what you first saw here that was very important, well, we need to break, well, I think one thing you were seeing is that we have to cleave a carbon-carbon bond. In fact, which bond are we going to cleave? Let's be specific, the bond between which two atoms? Two, one, and six. Yeah, the way we put in the numbering, we have to cleave this bond between one and six. So let's get into the habit of putting in a squiggle. That's another useful technique to show a bond we have to uh, break or a bond we have to form. And then you ask yourself, how can you break a carbon-carbon bond? I think you guys have only learned one way this term of breaking carbon-carbon bonds, which is ozonolysis. Uh, maybe there's another way, but that's the key way to break carbon-carbon bonds. So that's how we know that our last step here is going to be ozonolysis. 